episode. What did you say the theme was for that? Yeah, Anna. What is it? It's okay to lie. Okay, so you kind of put yourself into danger, but the danger isn't that the lie will be exposed. The danger is that you're going to have to be even more clever to get out of the lie. Yeah, so I think there's a theme there then for the book as a whole that um, maybe being dishonest and lying is not necessarily a bad thing in certain circumstances, like that it might not be the worst thing to do to be dishonest. Um, okay. So maybe it's not such a horrible thing to be dishonest, but that dishonesty piles up on top of each other and kind of spirals so that it can become out of control. Yeah. Um, one thing was that you said his, his name was one thing, and then you forgot what that thing was. It's uh, another thing. <laughs> yeah. So if you're gonna if you're gonna lie, you better keep all the <laughs> ideas straight. Yeah. All right, good. I like this because it's kind of like it's not necessarily giving like too much of a moral to lying. It's not saying don't lie, but it is saying how you can be a good liar. That's part of the theme. Yeah, Bella. I feel like a good theme for that would be like lying isn't the easy way out. Like it can actually make things harder. All right, cool. Like, so it's like the truth is better. Basically. Yes. So I think maybe sometimes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I'm still in this class because I lied about my grades. What? Okay, let's think about that. Um, do you think that this book is opposed to lying? No. no. Not at all. Sometimes maybe, but why would lying be like a good thing for this book? Yeah. I feel like really like lying, like the way the book works, right? It's like lying, like the way that lying you see, like sometimes in the book, like you yeah. think in the king, like how they're lying about who they are, that's kind of like seen as bad. Like, yes. Don't, don't try to cover up who you actually are and have to make it easier. But like, I feel like Huck lies throughout the book to evade like situations. Yeah. So he's not lying to like benefit himself. He's more lying to like for his company. Okay. Like happy things to either him or to someone else. And he's like, ooh. He doesn't like want to know if he wants to really like admit fully up to the truth and just get like either whacked with a worse situation. Right. So he'd rather take a situation where lying. He's not doing it for his benefit, like most liars do. Okay, good. So it's not with this like selfish intent. And if it is selfish, it is like to save himself. So like, for example, lying and saying that he like faking his own death to avoid being uh, abused by his father. We don't see that as like this, um, this terrible immoral, terrible crime that he's committed. I yeah, Bella? I think he kind of portrays lying as like a, a necessary evil. And yeah. If you can morally justify it, then it can be okay. But if you can't morally justify it, and if it's like you go for like your own selfish gain and you have to more, yeah. then it's seen as bad. Or if it's like harming other people. Right. But if it's just like lying about your identity to get out the way you don't get hurt or something like that, like that's kind of like morally justified or like lying for the sake of like um to try to genuinely help somebody but they don't fully believe you're telling the truth or something like that. yes like those things are like morally justified lies and therefore they're seen as good or at least excellent so it's like this way of saying that there might not be objective universal truth but that for every situation you have to determine whether or not it's okay to lie in that situation right and you're saying that like sometimes if it's done for the benefit of other people it would actually be the moral position to take it's not just a neutral position but when he lies to save jim's life and to uh kind of help jim earn his freedom that would be seen as a moral lie so there's like every situation you have to like judge the entire context to make that choice and that's a way harder thing to do than to just know never lie yeah zoe i have a question yeah when he first ran away was it because he was being abused by his father or was it because he was sick of being with a widow because if you like the widow is that a bad thing to be ran away i think his dad kidnaps him from the widow yeah and then he lies to escape his father but he, doesn't want, to go back to the but he doesn't want to go back to the widow because you're right he doesn't love the confinement that the widow gives him yeah he friends with tom right yes 
kind of lied to Tom, right? Yeah, I mean, Tom thinks he's dead too. So is that a moral position or is he lying to his friend? I don't know. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so yeah, Tom and Tom and Huck have been through so much together. Tom could have kept the lie, you know, and he, he goes off on his own instead. But could he have? I don't know. That's where I sit. I'm like, we're not through in this book with Tom, and I think you're going to be able to have a better answer to that question when, uh, yeah, when we're not done with Tom. Keep it in mind. Was he right to lie to Tom? Yeah, keep it over years old. That's so. It's not a spoiler. It'll be fine. Um. Okay. So do you see how we did? We looked at just the Huck dresses like a girl episode. We thought about sort of the morality surrounding his actions to come up with the theme. Um, I think you guys were talking about a lot of different things you could see in that in that little episode. So your episode that you came up with, uh, you you already wrote a theme for that episode, right? If you finish the assignment, that's what you were meant to do. So we are going to now write a paragraph about that theme. So that's why I have your computers out. Open up a Google Doc. And then open up, open up your books to the episodes that you've got the evidence. Yeah. No. Yeah. What? It's, it's a full one. I got it from you. Thanks so much. Um, have you ever, when we did the transcendentalism unit, have you ever had someone refuse you to write an essay on that? I never, that it would be I haven't, but I have gotten some satire from people because of that. Yes. I just I think it's, I think it's funny to I can still do that. I was I was considering writing an essay and being like, I refuse to write this because it's a cow. No, I didn't refuse to it's yeah, it's about being independent. Yeah. <laughs> but you have to accept the consequences. Your yeah. metaphorical jail would be the zero, right? <laughs> but you earn my respect. No. no. No, you look like. <laughs> yes, exactly. Wow, that was low. Okay, you've got a blank, uh, blank Google Doc open, right? I guess so. Okay, so we have in this class, we wrote a personal essay, we wrote a rhetorical analysis, and for Huck Finn, and don't freak out because it's in, it's after Christmas break, you've got a long time, but we're going to be writing a literary analysis about this book. What? I told you not to freak out. What? No. <laughs> so, 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 um, as we continue to read this book, we're going to continue to practice how to actually do this. A literary analysis is just where you identify a theme and you talk about all the ways that a writer is supporting that theme. So it is very similar, almost identical to a rhetorical analysis. You are just writing about fiction instead of nonfiction. So this is what you've done, I think, a million times before when you're talking about books and when you're writing about books in school, you write literary analyses, whether they called it that or not. Analyses is the plural of analysis. Okay, so to write this, you first are going to have a topic sentence that combines detail from the episode with theme from the episode. Let me show you what I mean. My episode was about the Grangerfords and Shepherdsons, and we talked about this last time in class. Um, they've got, there's one aspect of this, and then there's a theme that I want to talk about. So I want to talk about the theme that Southern aristocracy is ridiculous and founded on fraud. So that's my theme that I want to talk about with mine. And the literary aspect, the literary technique that I would like to talk about is the description of their house. We talked about last time you guys brought up the fact that the fruit has like chips in it so that you can see uh, into the like the chalk of the fruit. I think that description of the house is helping to support my theme. So then for my topic sentence, I am going to write, uh, Twain shows that Southern aristocracy is ridiculous 
and founded on fraud through his description of the Grangerford's house. This is an example. This is mine. All right. So, so do you see here how I've combined them, my theme and the one literary aspect I'm going to talk about in my paper. Now you are going to do this for your episode. So think about um, the theme that you have for your chosen episode and write one aspect in the text that you think supports that theme. Yes. Yes, you can talk if you did it in a group or with your partners, you can talk with them, but everybody has to write their own. So no one should look identical. Oh, sorry. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you'd like to grab your episode because you've forgotten, you can go grab it. It's in that pile. All right, I know people are going to grab their episodes. I am only going to give you three minutes to write the topic sentence. So this is just the first sentence. Um, but I want you to do this based on what you discussed last time. So you won't need a lot of time to get up new information. one paragraph. No, you're not allowed to try. I would like to leave. Okay, and you are going to turn this in for points, so make sure everyone is doing their own. I'm so sorry. I'm trying so hard. That's good. That's good. I don't like to this out where I feel like an idiot writing that. I don't know. I feel like that's what I was Okay, let me tell you about the next part because some people are here. If you don't have a topic sentence yet, that's okay. I'm going to give you a few minutes after this to work on your paragraph. So I've got my topic sentence. And do you remember quite a long time ago, we talked about the acronym for a successful paragraph? Topic sentence. Introduce the quotation, quotation analysis. 
All right, it does not have to be this formulaic. We wanna work on getting your writing sounding more natural, but essentially you do need all these parts in your, in your paragraph. You do need some sort of introduction to the quotation or else your audience is not going to know what you're talking about. You do need to use direct evidence because you're gonna be thinking about how Twain wrote this. And of course you need analysis because you wanna break down the quotation and tell me what makes it important to the theme. So up here, I'm gonna do my introduce the quotation. I'm going to say um, after Ta uh, Huck, Huck and Jim uh, lose their raft, Huck is washed ashore and meets the Grangerfords, a Southern, a rich Southern family that has a feud with um, another rich Southern family. I'm going to say he is very impressed and interested in their house. Okay, that's all I need for the context of the quotation. And now I'm going to start getting into the quotations that are important for me. If you had me last year as your 10th grade teacher, you know I really like embedding those quotations into your prose, choosing small quotations that kind of naturally flow with your writing. Um, the way that you do that is you're only going to quote the things that are important to your analysis. So you're looking at, you know, where the literary, the literary aspect that he has, and you're looking at what's going to be important to quote, and you're only quoting those bits, and then the rest of it, you're paraphrasing. So let me show you how I would do that up here. I would say something like, um, he describes the house as gaudy. Um, it is full of trinkets and uh, decorations that at first appear, um, I don't know, fancy, but on careful and on more careful inspection. their fakeness. I don't know. These aren't great words, but tackiness. Okay. For example, the fake fruit is is redder and yellower and prettier than real ones is but immediately reveal but immediately but uh also are picked off and showed the white chalk or whatever it was underneath okay Sorry, that took longer than I thought it would. Um, so I wanna talk about the word gaudy. I wanna talk about this description of the fruit and I wanna talk about the chipped quality to it. So those are the things that I'm going to quote. All right, once I've got that part, this is where I'm gonna do the analysis and I am going to show how these details in the quotations are relevant for, I'm gonna spell relevant right, for the theme. And that's ultimately what my analysis should be. Okay, I'm hoping that this is a bit of a review since we've talked about paragraph structure. I'm gonna give you 10 minutes now to write your paragraph. It's okay if you consult a little bit with your partner or your team, um, but you wanna write, do your own work on this. Yes, Bella. Yes, yep, <laughs> on, on, on further consideration, you've got a better theme, that's awesome. That's how English should go. I'm gonna keep working up here. So if you get uh, lost on what you're supposed to do, you can glance up at the screen.
Let's Start. Don't worry about it being perfect, just right as you can. Unless you're saying three passes. Well, I mean, like, have you had Yeah, it's almost like a weakening. So it's like, uh, we went it's over standing the and standing and starting. Yeah, it's standing and still like for <laughs> You're not. I am not the brightest opinion. I think you're the very brightest opinion. Well, I'm going to lie to you. Yes, Em. Um, Thank you. 
Give you two more minutes to go as far as you can with this. In fact, I run to the restroom. When I get back, I'm turning it in. What? 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 Wait, no. Are we supposed to wait? Just, just one paragraph. Just one paragraph. Oh, okay. You're just writing one paragraph about one theme and one literary aspect from your own. Okay. I'll be right next <laughs> The word You can make it. Yeah, you should just have a Wait, oh, I saw my back. I'm just writing it. I'm just writing it. I'm just writing it. I'm just writing it. I'm just Yeah, how many how many of you are actually done with the paragraph? Yeah. Okay. A few more minutes, but yeah. But let's have it silent in here while you while you finish it up. Super concentrated. Already looking. 
Shh. I'm kind of sorry. <laughs> Super focused to get done. Okay, let's pause for a second. So I, I started on this. Um, I showed you where I had the quotations. I decided that I wanted to break that up a little bit and use some analysis in between my quotations. So that's what I mean by it doesn't have to be this formulaic. It just needs to have these things in the paragraph. So I say the word gaudy signals that the decorations are superficial. They might show that the family had the money to purchase them at some point, but that their wealth has not produced good taste. Instead, all the decorations seem random and contradictory. A parrot sits next to a cat, which sits next to a dog, which sits next to fans made of turkey wings. There is a menagerie of animals presented here, none of them usually seen in the same setting. So I am kind of picking apart this word gaudy. I also am referencing the other decorations. Then I say the home has not been kept up either, allowing the lack of substantiality underneath the surface. I need to fix that part. Huck observes, I meant to say like showing. Huck observes that the displayed fake fruit is redder, blah, blah, blah. There's my other quote. And then I say, even a child from a poor background, unfamiliar with this kind of wealth, notices that reality is more substantial and appealing than the emptiness in the middle of mere decoration and displays of wealth. I am not at my top today with writing, but I, I love, I'm so good. I'm such a bad writer. Sorry, I didn't say that. Um, but what I mean is like, it doesn't flow as well as I want it to. But what I'm saying is like, you guys, I gave you a time situation and you did with it what you could. So I know that they're not perfect. But one thing I want you to notice in your paragraph, how many people have a direct quotation that they're analyzing? Raise your hand. Sure. Okay, good. That's a huge part of, of this literary analysis. It needs to be a direct quotation. And do you notice here how I quote the word and then I kind of pick up out, apart the word? I actually looked gaudy up in the dictionary just to see if I could it could spark some ideas for me. And I started writing about what that gaudiness might mean. I don't do that down here. I haven't said anything about his language choices here. So what I want us to do now is wherever you are in your paragraph, I want you to find where you have a direct quotation. 
And even if you did say something about his language choices, I want you to say one more thing. So I don't want anyone turning this in yet. I want you to choose one more thing you could say about his language choices. So for me, I'm gonna talk about the chalk part of it and I'm gonna add that into my paragraph. So that's what I want you to do do a little revision where you add some analysis. Ooh, a scrap, a dispute. Quarrel, a squabble. There's a million. I like squabble. A clash. Enmity. A fracas. <laughs> Rivalry is a good one for the me. Okay, so the detail that I add, I just talked a little bit about chalk. I said it's, it's an extremely cheap, abundant resource. It's also the opposite of what you would want fruit to taste like. Um, and in fact, I even say that when we describe a bad taste, we often call it chalky. So the fact that the fruit has chalk at the middle signifies its utter uselessness. So I just wanted to point out one thing about the choices that he made as an author. You know, which, what did he choose to call this? Like, what did he say was at the middle of this fake fruit? Chalk. Well, I'm saying that's significant and it uh, helps prove this point that Southern aristocracy is founded on fraud. Yeah. He did. Yeah. We're doing it anyway. <laughs> Can you even believe that? He said you could, he said you get shot. Yeah. I Finally. we're all gonna get shot. Finally. I know. I know. <laughs> all right. So wherever you are in your paragraph now. That is exactly what you should do to write your normal essays. That is what I am getting at. <laughs> <laughs> this is exactly the kind of paragraph you'd write in a literary analysis where you really pick something apart. So you are going, you're going to submit this to the assignment for today called Huck Finn Paragraphs. Uh, I decided we're just doing one paragraph, so ignore the S. In fact, well, I'll edit it after we're done. So you're just going to submit the file. No use, like, you don't need to clean it up or anything. I will find your paragraph and just submit the file there. No, oh, I labeled it does contain a <laughs> No, it never does. <laughs> no way. There's no way. No way. No, you didn't. I just kicked his butt. Not yet. I still. No, he doesn't. All right, I'm going to.
gonna give you one minute to get that submitted. I'm I'm calling it. You gotta be done with the paragraph. It's okay if it's like mid sentence even. I'll know you were working on it. Submit it. Yes. Yeah.
distance, which I don't know about you, but that's like a very comforting sound, I think, when, you know, there's like some sort of like kind of distant murmuring, you know, it's like this ASMR type thing where people are like, they're kind of like being lulled into this nice, like, um, tell Pastor, but we'll do that next time, like this really nice, like, connection with nature. All right. But then Huck gets to thinking, and that's in this section. So it says, it was Jack, it says, but it warrants, we're tripping that. It was Jack a lantern for the lightning bug. So he sat down again and went to watching the same as before. Jim said it made him all over trembly and feverish to be so close to freedom. Well, I can tell you it made me all over trembly and feverish too to hear him because I began to get it to my head that he was most free and who was to blame for it? Why me? I couldn't get that out of my conscience. So how, uh, no how, nor no way. It got to troubling me so I couldn't rest. I couldn't stay still in one place. Um, let's stop right there. So in this first part, he repeats that phrase, trembly and feverish, twice. With uh, your, oh yeah, you do not have one, good, sorry. Um, with your partner across the aisle, I want you to talk about how these two emotions, even though they're written in the same way, are different. What does it mean that Jen is feeling trembly and feverish, and what does it mean that Huck is feeling trembly and feverish? So you're talking to your person across the aisle. Okay, write down in the margin what is scorched. 
notations in the D notations, what is scorch? What's that word? All right, same rows moving the same way. So every other row here is moving up one. Awesome. Okay. Um, so here we go. Scorch me more and more. I tried to make out to myself that I weren't to play because I didn't run Jim off with the rightful owner, but it weren't no use. Punches up and says every time, but you know he was running for his freedom and you could have paddled the shore and told someone. That was so. I couldn't get around that. No way. That was where it pinched. Okay, same as we did with Scorch. Talk about the word pinched. Okay, let's keep going. So that was where it hit. Conscience says to me, what had poor Miss Watson done to you that you could see her go off right under your eyes and never say one single word? What did that poor old woman do to you that you could treat her so mean? Why, she tried to learn you your book. She tried to learn you your manners. She tried to be good to you every way she knows how. That's what she wants. All right, what I want you to talk about here is do you think his logic is faulty? So he's starting to feel bad about himself because he's like, uh, he's decided that um, he shouldn't, you know, treat Miss Watson this way by helping her slave escape. Do you think that is good logic or bad logic when you're talking to, uh, you're talking to your partner about this? Okay, go for it.
before we move again, what did you think about this whole process? Like the whole philosophy? Um, I thought it was like bad luck and it was um you guys have seen the bad employees to do and then what happens when you don't trust me and I I told them to be the person that I trusted. I think it's very important to trust your company to be clear to them what you want to do for you, but then also be clear to them what they want to trust you to be calling you. Okay, so his logic here is like he thinks that um, he's accepted the idea that human beings are cognitive. Um, and so he, if uh, he's hurt a human being, Miss Watson, by taking her object that he should be able to trust. Jeff? Um, I think that there's So maybe there's something wrong here that he's taking personal responsibility for something that he shouldn't be taking personal responsibility for. about the greater yeah he doesn't think like the greater small. but he only started to think about it like what he's done like the people that he's done when he did the point where he's like I put all these people around me and like this is what they have to do and this is what they have to do. Okay good good so to go back to Jeff's point here it's like he's thinking about his own personal responsibility but what he should be thinking about is the greater social good that he said. Um and so I feel like Robert because she taught him um, all sorts of things and he's feeling guilty because he forgot to do this. But it's his, like, she gave him education, but she also took away his entire existence and being his life. His kids are, like, gone and he has his life and freedom, which is just kind of crazy. Yeah, okay, so it's like just because she did one very good thing, taking an orphan and tried to make his life better, doesn't mean that she's universally good, that she's also done really bad things with these children that maybe he should have taken them. So I think for us, his logic is off, but if you look at it like from our point of view, Kim, like it, it kind of mimics the southern like way of thinking about slavery, right? Like how it's an object. How can he not take personal responsibility for it? You know what I mean? An object just can't like disappear or run away. It's not toy story. Yeah. So I think it kind of mimics like the whole like um white control view that the white people need to take personal responsibility for the people that are under them that like built their society on like the backs of slavery. So it, it, it almost like symbolizes that relationship between okay, he may have done this by himself, but I'm responsible for it because I'm the one. Oh yeah, that's a great point, right? That he's um he he might not be seeing it in the terms that Frederick Douglass described when he's saying that like oh white people think that the slave is better off in slavery, but he is seeing that relationship as one of control and one of responsibility. So he thinks even though he's a child <laughs> and Jim is a full grown adult in his thirties, really um here I mean he has he has kids here. Doc is then the one taking responsibility because I am the white person. All right, we gotta move on from this point. Let's keep coming back to this idea though. <laughs> I'm sorry, so you're like, what about me? Sorry, um, we're gonna come back to this idea um, because it continues on this track. So move once again. And we're back to the beginning, yes? Uh, oh, for you guys, that's it. All right, got it, all right. Um, okay, so he says, I got the feeling so mean and so miserable, I most wish I was dead. I fidgeted up and down the raft, abusing myself to myself, and Jim was fidgeting up and down past me. We neither of us could keep still. Every time he danced around and, said, and said, there's Cairo, it went through me like a shot. And I thought if it was Cairo, I reckon I would die of miserableness. So kind of similar to what we did with the first question, 
Twain uses some repetition here, using the word fidgeted and then fidgeting to describe what both of them are doing. I want you to discuss what's the different tone behind those words fidgeted and fidgeted. So how is fidgeted different than fidgeted? Talk to us together. <laughs> Okay, move again. All right, it keeps going. It says, Jim talked out loud all the time while I was talking to myself. He was saying how the first thing he would do when he got to a free state, he would go to uh, he would go to saving up money and never spend a single cent. When he got enough, he would buy his wife, which, oh. he, which was owned on a farm close to where Miss Watson lived. And then they would both work to buy the two children. And if their master wouldn't sell them, they'd get an abolitionist to go and steal them. It most froze me to hear such talk. Okay, like Huff feels in this, he's frozen. He's like, oh no, what have I done? He goes on to say, like, it's not just, uh, you know, freeing one slave, then it's going to end up freeing four slaves, which like, oh no, what have I done, right? We, as the reader, feel differently. So, how is the reader supposed to feel? This is what you're discussing. How is the reader supposed to feel reading this information about Jim's family and how Jim's wife got there? Okay, Way you feel when you hear Jim talking about his family, where you're like, how do you 
oh my gosh, there's so much more at stake here. Like, I want him to free his wife. I want him to free the kids. Like, it, it is terrible that we're even talking about this situation. I think that's how Mark Twain wants us to see. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. to, but the words wouldn't come. I tried for a second or two to brace up and out with it, 
but I weren't man enough. I'm the funk of a rabbit. I see I was weakening, so I just give up trying and up and says he's white. So he lies. He doesn't do what you know he set out to do. He's his conscience. Instead, he kind of says, no, but I'm going to go with like what I think on the inside. He says the words wouldn't come because he weren't man enough. I want you to discuss with your partner, why do you think the words wouldn't come or come? Why wasn't he able to give up the <laughs> Let me know if you're not able to hear. 